Hello everyone, welcome to this new series of video about how to go from data to big data analytics. Um, today we will introduce the first module about parallel computing and the first chapter of this module is about traits and um, in the upcoming videos we'll talk about much more advanced topic. Here we will discuss about um, scheduling and managing big data on your home computer. In the next chapter we'll talk about MP High. That involves uh, working on multiple processes on a network, a network of multiple computers. We'll talk about distributed storage, uh, NoSQL database, uh, database partitioning. We'll also talk about distributed computation with um, framework like MapReduce or Spark. So let's get started with trade today by defining what a process is. Actually, a process can be viewed as a running program, usually an, an isolated environment, and that's completely managed by the operating system. Um, in Compared to traits, that actually is just a running subprogram. It means one process can start as many traits as he wants and manage them. And but the process is actually managed by the operating system. To see more clearly what the difference can be, we can see it here, um, where we have mini processor and uh, this at the left is multiprocessing. This on the right is multi uh, threading. In on multiprocessing, we have many programs running on different cores, so running different processes. They have their own memory, they have their own code. So if you want to go from one process to another, you have to um, copy the memory and copy the code also, because otherwise the proce process cannot access the data that this process have here. In contrast to uh, threads, we have uh, many threads, thread by maybe one process, and the thread have one share memory, and one share code, so the code executed by the straight are actually the same. And um, as you can see here, there's a slight difference because in multiprocessing, um, we are using all the cores, so each program is running on one core and it's a uh, real parallelism. But on trades, what's happening is like the operating system is actually scheduling who is supposed to run at each time. So it's a chunk of the trade, a chunk of the program running at a given time and uh, just you know swapping between trades in 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 um, at different time and that gives an illusion of parallelism. It's not actually completely parallelism uh, when we talk about multi trading, but that can be executed on multiple core also. Uh, like we can see on the right here, like we have maybe core one and core two. The operating system decide to attribute trade three to core one at this time and trade one to core two, so they are kind of parallel here. But they can just sweep at any time. You know, that is also something you need to really understand to, to master the difference between multi processing and multi trading. If you want one call, you can run thousands of trades on this one call. It's just scheduling, it's just a operating system being able to say, okay, you come first, this chunk come first, this chunk come uh, after this chunk, and then so forth. And this is how the operating system manages your trades. So let's see it directly into the code. We have two possibilities to do trades with Python. We can do it with functions and we can do it with classes. Here I'll show an example on how we do trace in Python with classes. All we have to do is just trade a class that will be the child of this main trade class. And in that case, when we just call the start on this trade, it will call to run function of that uh, class. Like here, for example, this is really simple. We just create a um, class that get a message and print that message in an infinite loop and then wait for one second and then print again. This will help us know uh, exactly how the scheduling is working, okay? Let's say we create those four traits here, one, two, three, and four. Maybe you may think that they will be executed like trade one, trade two, trade three, trade four, and then start again. But you will see it here that when we execute it on the pi, it's completely different. You can see it's in order here, but it changed completely here. And this is because of this scheduling done by the operating system that I was explaining back here. It can just attribute the third trade at the beginning, or the, the, the data trade at the second position, uh, that it completely depends on the, on, the, on the printing system, as if I should stop the, the, the process here. You will see that you have one, two, four, three, three, one, two, four, you know, it's it's going in you know, any direction, depending on how the operating system scheduler just attribute which trace to which uh, call at which moment, okay. Um, we can also have many trade on uh, multiple calls, as it was explained here, but they are not being executed like at the same time, you don't have this right here and this right here at the same time, you know. They're just chunk being executed at given time and then swapping 
to the next chunk being executed at the second uh, time. Okay, so this is um, um, a simple way to trade trace in Python. But um, I will just explain something else to you here. This 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 join here is something that you may need to know while working with trades. If we just you know delete this part, if you if you see up there, there's no done function. It means the trade are being executed, executed, executed without ev uh, without never reaching this here, this this continue done part here. But if we don't have this join here, let's just clear it. And we start the function again. You will see that the done is just done directly at any given moment, actually, because the operating system is not waiting for all the trade to stop before going to the next uh, to the next part. This join helps you to wait until all the trade that you have launched stopped before going to the next part. So how can this be useful? Let's say you are working on an operation where you just want maybe to give a sub program to trades, and the trade will take care of that program but you actually don't need that part in the next part of your code. You will just, um, you will never need to join, to, you know, to call the join function on, that, on those traits because you will just stop your program from running the next part and you will not really need to the result of the trade. But if in the contrast you need the result of the trades, you will need to join because the operating system will wait until all the trades are over and until you get the result, until you can actually get the result of all uh, the operation made by the trades before going to the next step of your code. So that can be useful in that case also. Yes, so let's get into the next part of trades that's actually um, synchronization. Synchronization means when you launch multiple trades, um, you need to um, actually manage them in order to have a, a certain consistency. Let's see, let's get this example um, where we have this simple program. It just update the money by 10, right? And we launch 20 trades um, updating according to the same function in parallel. So what you may want as an output of this program is just 20 function, 20, uh, this function being called 20 times. And this result will be 2000. That's what it's supposed to be um, done somehow. So that's a result that we are waiting for. That, that we are waiting for. And then we are actually waiting for all the trades to terminate. So that's the expected result, but we will see something surprising here, which is called right into the... Then you will see that the value is just random. You know, it's just randomly not to, to, to one, right? And this is uh, for a simple reason. Um, you know, when you leave those trades, updating the same value at the same time, you will have multiple trades changing that value at the same time, actually. So you may have like, trade one and trade two and trade three, doing this same operation with the value being zero. So they don't care about who is coming first and which is coming next. So what's happening here is that this value will be zero for many trades. And they will just update it here with uh, by adding 10. So uh, all the trade that got this value zero uh, have this result being 10 at the end. And uh, we don't want that to happen. We want our trades to be kind of synchronized. And for that reason, we use what we call locked. And to do that, we just call lock here and create a new lock here. We call it lock is equal to lock. Okay. And what we do here is like we do a lock dot um, release uh, here, sorry. And then we do a lock dot release here. Okay, let's first show you the result. So you see that the synchronization actually worked. It gave you the expected value. But what's happening here? Um, let's get a simple example. Okay, let's imagine you're in a dormitory and there's a bathroom in that dormitory. There are many students. In the morning, every student wants to bath in order to go to school. But the bathroom is just, you know, available for one person at a time. So what is done here, what the mechanism that we actually use in real life is to, you know, the lock that we have on the door. So when someone access to the washroom, you just lock the door. And when he finished, he unlocked the door and other people can enter the bathroom. That's actually the same thing happening here. So what we are doing here is like, when one trade is trying to access this part of the code, we say, okay, we lock it. So other will wait until this part is actually completely executed. And he said, okay, I finished my part. I can release a lock. So we can go further. Right? And then um, the next trade will come and do the same thing. 
and we will have kind of synchronization because we will have the inspected value um, because we, we don't have to trace updating the value at the same time. Okay, great. So with that said, um, yeah. So with that said, there are some problem when you use the, those logs, you have to be careful because you may create um, a, a problem of um, entail locking. We call it deadlock, you know, one person locking another, one trade locking one, another trade and the same trade locking, locking the, yeah, the first one. And they are not able to go further because they are both locks, right? Like for example, here, if this is lock for all the trades, they will just wait until this is called. But if this is never called, your, your program will just execute indefinitely. And um, that's not the situation that we want, okay? So in that case, we need um, something really simple. Um, but in order to show you how and what exactly that's it, I need to show you this example of a bank account, for example. Let's say if John wants to send money to Jane, the account of John and Jane should be locked at the same time because if John, if you are trying to update the amount in the account of John, we need to lock this account. And if, if you are trying to update the amount in, in the account of Jane, we need to lock it also. So when John is trying to send money to Jane, what we do is that we first lock the account of John, remove the money in his account, go to the account of Jane, lock her account also so no one try to access the same account at the same time, um, uh, causing the problem that we had previously because otherwise you will just have 10 persons sending you $1,000 and at the end you can just get $1,000 in your bank account in this situation we don't have, we don't want. So you need to lock also Jane account and put the money in the in, in this account and just release lock. But in that situation, let's say both of them try to send money to so to each other. It means when John would want to send money to um, Jane, John would block the Jane account. Okay. At the same time, Jane is trying to lock to send money to John, so Jane will block John account. Okay. Right. So what's happening here is like. When John just blocked Jane's account, he tried to, ac uh, to acquire a lock to his own account because he want to send money, you know, he want to remove, I mean, the, the coding, he want to remove money in his account, right? But this will not be possible because change locked John's account. At the same time, Jane wants to uh, um, remove money from her account to send to Jane to John's account, but John just locked Jane's account also. So Jane and John are locked, so let's just execute the code so you see what's happening here. You will see they are blocked. They will not send money to each other because they can't acquire the lock on, on just actually their, their own account, okay? So um, this is a situation where we, we don't really want to have this kind of situation, otherwise we are, all our multi traded programs will be extremely slow and, you know, not working at all. And to solve this problem, um, there's no you know, general solution, it depends on how you code, but uh, at least you have to take care to make sure that the lock that, you, I mean, the place that you're um, lo calling the lock function must be completely executed without any problem. You may have some um, problem happening, like for example, here, we, if we just, you know, throw an error here, somehow to get a kind of problem, this release will not be called and the, 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 the lock will be you know, not accessible and the program will not be, um, be executed. So for that, for that, for that, for that case, we need to somehow, uh, be careful about how we write the code and be careful about, um, you know, um, catching any exception that we can have in the lock part of our code. For example, here, if we don't have this catch part, we'll see that this lock is acquired. We have this, you know, this, this error, for example, let's, you know, the, 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 there's some error that, are, that is thrown in our, in our code, but the lock is never released. We need to be careful about that also. Okay. So with that said, we need to, go, we, we can go to the next part. That's actually, you know, trading goals and dependency graphs. Right then, of course. Yeah. So what is a trading pool? Uh, I showed you how to create, manage, um, a lot of trades, right? But if you have to do it on a really huge amount of trades, it can be really painful and very difficult for you. That is why we have these trade pools. 
it is a way to for, for Python to help us. We just give him what we need and the worker as we want, and he will be the, ma the, the the person scheduling, working on uh, scheduling the trades, managing everything concerning the trades, and we will just get the result at the end. So he will be the one splitting the data, be the one attributing the data to each trade, be the one who just you know create a new trade when there's a free place for one trade, and at the end. You just you know you just get the result that you want, and I wanted to introduce the concept the concept of dependency graph. Let's imagine you have a function that depends on another function that depends on another function, and you want to put them in a trade. You need to be careful about writing each step, knowing which function depends on which function, in order to write a program that will not be buggy somehow. So um, uh, this is uh, everything I needed to explain about um, trades in Python, actually. But uh, there is more, but not available for Python, fortunately. All we did manually, we can do it with the framework. Um, this is an um, framework. There's a framework called OpenMP. It's just available for uh, other languages like Java, but not for Python. But it can help you to easily, like really, really easily um, do uh, multi-trading on any kind of program that you, that you want. So like um, all we need to do with this OpenMP program uh, is just to call a single line and it will parallelize a loop maybe, for example, that we have or, or whatever. So I think I've been through every topic that we need to discuss about content concerning multi-trading. And uh, I hope I didn't forget something so that's the end of this video, of this chapter actually. And um, in the next chapter, we'll talk about MPI, message processing system, with Python, of course. And uh, we will explain how to do this multi trading we were doing on one computer in a network of computers, so on many computer scheduling tasks. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for the upcoming videos.